Hello and welcome to the Tent of Meeting podcasts. What is the Tent of Meeting, I hear you ask? Well, let me explain. In the Hebrew Bible, in the books of Exodus and Numbers, we find the account of Yahweh's guidance of the Israelites having escaped the tyranny at the hands of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to freedom through the parted Red Sea. Yahweh is the God of Israel who promised to deliver his people to a land flowing with milk and honey. His guidance will find its physical expression in the mobile tent of meeting, where Yahweh's revelation will continue throughout Israel's journey through the wilderness. In the descending pillar of cloud which settles at the entrance to the tent of meeting and constitutes the definitive form of the face of Yahweh, the Tent of Meeting is the sanctuary where Moses installs the Ark of Covenant, which he received in Mount Sinai, containing the replacement set of tablets of the Decalogue, the focal statement of the terms of the covenant, the contract, if you like, which Yahweh has entered into with his people, the Israelites. It is in the Tent of Meeting where God will meet with Moses and provide divine guidance on the journey into the Promised Land. It is the tent of meeting for Moses, the highest consecrated representative of the people, receives guidance from God. And so just as the tent of meeting was Israel's sanctuary in the wilderness, I thought it would be appropriate to call my podcast by the same name and invite anyone who is hungry to receive God's guidance and his word and his wisdom to join with me in God's presence to listen for God's word and guidance for our lives today. So as we do that, I pray that just as Moses did, we will experience and encounter our Creator God face to face in our tent of meeting. Moses, as we've just heard, was the, the one God chose and called to rescue and deliver his people from the grasp of tyranny at the hands of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Moses was the one who received the tablets of the Decalogue, literally the Ten Words, and was regarded as the founding father of the nation of Israel, and was the one through whom God provided divine guidance for the journey of God's people from Egypt through the wilderness and across the Jordan to the Promised Land. So the question I'm asking this morning is where does Jesus fit into the story of God's people and the Hebrew Bible, and in fact the Bible itself. To try and answer that question, turn with me, if you will, to the New Testament, to Mark's Gospel, chapter 8 and verse 27. It says, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Two questions spring to mind. Firstly, why does Mark mention Caesarea Philippi? And secondly, what's Mark trying to tell us, his readers, about Jesus? Well, firstly, Caesarea Philippi was an ancient Roman city, about 120 miles from Jerusalem. So if Edinburgh was Jerusalem, Aberdeen would be where the town of Caesarea Philippi was situated. It was near the southern slope of Mount Hermon, which was a mountain range near one of the three springs that fed the Jordan River marking the limit of the conquests of Moses and Joshua on the east of the Jordan. At the time of Jesus, this particular territory was governed by Philip, one of Herod the Great's three sons, and this place was named after him in honour of Caesar, hence Caesarea Philippi, meaning Caesarea of Philip. It was also the northern limit of Jesus' travels during his ministry, 
So there would also have been a strong Jewish community in that area. For the Jewish population at that time, it was the association with the conquests of Moses, the founding father of the nation, that made it holy ground and gave rise to the tensions between their worship of the one true God in the midst of an occupying force who worshipped a pagan Roman God. Remember, the Jewish people believed that no other God but Yahweh would be tolerated. So that for now is the context of the place of Caesarea Philippi. Turning now to Jesus' teaching, he asks the disciples two questions. Who do people say I am? And who do you say I am? Now I want you to notice the words I am. Who do others say I am? Who do you say I am? At this point let me now take you back to the Hebrew Bible, to Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, the calling of Moses at the burning bush. Moses has just encountered the Lord in the burning bush that wasn't consumed. God says to him, Moses, you're my man. I've seen the misery and the oppression of my people in Egypt, so I'm going to send you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. I want you to go. Moses then tries his best to negotiate with God. No way, Lord, he says, not me, choose someone else. Then he softens to God's will. And then we get to verse 13, where Moses says, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you. And they ask me, what's his name? What shall I say to them? Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, This is what you shall say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Now to you and me, that's not exactly a very satisfying answer. But that's what scripture tells us. But do you see, Moses asks God who he is. In our passage from Mark, Jesus asks his disciples who he is. Who do you say I am? Noticeably, he doesn't give an answer. Because I believe that that's for you and I to work out in our life. There are other parallels. In Mark chapter 9 verse 2, Jesus took Peter, James and John and led them up a high mountain. In Exodus chapter 19 and verse 3 we're told Moses went up to God. And so both stories have a mountain in common and the people's leader at that time going up on it. So I believe there's a deliberate comparison going on here between Moses and Jesus. A Jewish audience would not fail to, to hear and to see the nuances. This is challenging stuff. It goes against everything they have been taught. It is a re-evaluation of all they know and believed in the light of Jesus. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 5, Peter says to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Of course, Moses and Elijah were the heroes of the Hebrew Bible. Verse 7, then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Verse 8, suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. Do you see? Jesus is now the epicentre of Mark's account, 
and his goal is to connect the man Jesus with the ancient traditions of his people's sacred writings. So Mark's message is highly controversial. He is claiming that Jesus supersedes Moses. As Moses was the leader of Israel, God's people, Jesus is the leader of all people, both Jew and Gentile, both Jew and non-Jew. For the Gospel writer Mark, Jesus is the rightful heir to the throne. Jesus is God's Messiah, God's chosen one. He is Lord of all. The challenge for us all as we stand at the foot of the mountain and consider the gods we have worshipped or still worship in our lives today is to answer the question Jesus asked his disciples all these years ago and still asks his followers today. Do you hear the question he's asking you today, now? Who do you say I am? Let's pray. Gracious and loving Father, from the beginning of time, you have sought the hearts of your children whom you created for relationship with you. But the freedom you have given us means so many of their own free will have turned a way to worship their own gods, created in their own image. But Lord, your faithful followers want to see and be part of your kingdom. And so help us to see who Jesus is that we may be challenged to follow him and to live for him and to live for him alone. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.